Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, why the United States continues to weaponize and what impact that's having outside its borders. Also this week, Brexit budget, the cost of a disorderly UK exit from the European Union, plus... There's no question, it is the right thing to do. Walking out on Google, thousands of workers around the world protest, declaring time is up on sexual harassment. It's a long-lived and established industry that likely won't be going anywhere anytime soon. We're counting the cost this week of the weaponization of America. The latest atrocity on October the 27th. Eleven people were killed when a heavily armed gunman opened fire at a baby naming ceremony at a synagogue in Pittsburgh. Police said he used a legally purchased assault rifle and three handguns. In our previous investigation into this industry, we noted how gun manufacturers themselves rarely give interviews. Dozens of companies have ended partnerships with the National Rifle Association, or NRA, the pro-gun lobby. But U.S. President Donald Trump immediately directed attention to the lack of an armed guard at the synagogue, claiming the shooting has little to do with the country's gun laws. This is a case where if they had an armed guard inside, they might have been able to stop him immediately. So this would be a case for if there was an armed guard inside the temple, they would have been able to stop him. Barry Weber was one of those who survived the synagogue shooting. I think the NRA has so much political clout that there is no way in the world our polit politicians have the, the strength to take them out of the equation. Who needs an AR-15? Who needs a semi-automatic weapon? What's it good for? It may be target practice, but that's all. Well, the U.S. gun industry is estimated to be worth $51 billion, so guns are big business. The lack of regulation is key to the industry's profitability. Military-style weapons are a consumer product in the U.S. A background check is conducted only in store purchases. Part of the reason for the lack of gun control is the National Rifle Association. It says it speaks for American gun owners who have a constitutional right to bear arms. Then there's the USA's role in the global weapons trade. The U.S. buys and sells almost as much weaponry as the rest of the world combined. So what happens in the U.S. has global impact. Well, joining me now via Skype from London is Andrew Feinstein. Andrew is the executive director of Corruption Watch, the author of Shadow World Inside the Global Arms Trade. Good to have you with us. So, Andrew, just to put things into perspective at the start, how profitable is the U.S. guns industry compared to others? We need to start by saying that the United States produces somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of all weaponry in the world. So this is an industry that is worth tens of billions of dollars to the United States. The industry in small and light weapons, handguns, submachine guns, rifles, etc., is a smaller component of that, globally worth about $8 billion. So in the U.S., probably worth around $4 billion. There have been repeated public outcries against gun violence. The industry has managed in the U.S. to successfully insulate itself against any sort of backlash, hasn't it, though? How? Oh, absolutely. I think the National Rifle Association, the main gun lobby group in the United States of America, has been incredibly successful in creating a, a public climate that is pro-gun, but far more important than that, it has effectively bought the support of the politicians who would need to regulate the industry. And unfortunately, that flow of money to those politicians, which enables them to stay in power because America is often described as the best democracy money can buy, or as I describe, the weapons procurement business in the United States as a form of legal bribery, those politicians are effectively insulated from public opinion. Now, there is a possibility 
in the imminent American elections that we could, for the first time in many decades, start to see a, sh a slight shift in that. We are seeing a number of um, public groups, brilliant groups, like um, Moms Demand Gun Control, for instance, who are trying to energize voters not to vote for any candidate who is not critical of the gun lobby and doesn't commit to much greater regulation of guns in the United States. Let's broaden the discussion a little bit. How does that situation impact the economies of other countries, particularly countries close to the US, like Mexico, for example? It has massive impact in the world on two levels, really. First of all, it creates this global environment of militarism. So again, remembering that the United States is involved in more conflicts than, than any other country on the planet. In fact, the United States government employs more people to run one aircraft carrier than it has diplomats across the entire world. And the United States today has 11 aircraft carriers. How that affects America's immediate neighbors is even more insidious. So a country like Mexico that has certain law and order problems relating to the drugs trade and relating to gun running. The vast majority of those guns in Mexico, used by militias, used by criminals, both organized and informal, come from the United States of America. So while Donald Trump talks about building a wall between the United States and Mexico, what he doesn't seem to realize is that there is an enormous and very profitable flow of guns into Mexico from the US that he probably wouldn't want to stop. So you have the flow of guns into Mexico, and in return, you have a flow of drugs and other illicit activities into the United States of America. So what this is doing is it's both destabilizing those neighboring countries like Mexico, where it's giving criminal groups enormous power and firepower, but at the same time, it's having a devastating impact in the United States itself. Oh, how would you respond to those who, who would criticize that line and say, you're muddling two separate things, the illicit and the licit uh, trade in guns? I've been, I've been studying the trade in arms for 17 years now. The boundaries, the borders between the legal and the illegal are incredibly fuzzy. So our governments and the weapons makers themselves would have us believe that there is this formal legal trade in weapons, that on the opposite side of the spectrum is the black trade, the, the illicit trade. The reality is that the vast, vast majority of these transactions be they for aircraft carriers or jet fighters, or be they for handguns and semi-automatic weapons, take place somewhere in the middle, in what I describe as the shadow world, in the gray market, where there is bribery and corruption. And this includes by governments, including the governments of the main weapons producing countries of the world. It also includes executives of the main weapons producing companies, because bribes don't only flow in one direction. They also flow back to the executives of the countries pay paying the bribes. So in the work that I've done over 17 years, I could literally count on one hand the number of armament transactions that do not involve an element of illegality. The problem then becomes that most of these transactions and most of the people who operate in this shadow world, which includes some of our most senior politicians and government ministers, some of our most senior military leaders, and of course the weapons making companies, the vast, vast majority of them act in this trade with a degree of legal impunity. And this is most reflected in the reality that we recorded, and this was going back all the way to the end of 2011. All right, and a final point. Tell us how the NRA influences international efforts to try and regulate and control the global trade in arms. So what the NRA does very effectively, the NRA is actually quite a small organization, but it is incredibly closely linked not only to the manufacturers of handguns and smaller and light weapons, but also to the behemoths of the global weapons industry. So the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's, the BAE systems. 
It is from these sorts of groups that it gets most of its money. So what it does is in the work that it does in the United States of America, which is to create a particularly conducive environment, an unregulated environment for the sale of weaponry, the, N the NRA, together with these companies, then try and spread that message throughout the world. So the message is not just about the issue of unregulated gun ownership being very closely linked to issues of freedom and liberty, but also the need for an environment of militarism where military force is the preferred way to resolve conflicts. And we see that manifesting all over the world. So for instance, with the lurch to the far populist right that we have seen in Brazil over the last few days, part of the agenda of that far right movement in Brazil is the deregulation of gun ownership in a society that has problems of gangsterism, that has problems of armed criminals. So the NRA is effectively spreading the American message of liberty and militarism globally. Andrew Feinstein, thanks so much for your thoughts. Thank you very much. Still to come on Counting the Cost. It's the only country in the world to measure success, not through GDP, but through gross national happiness. But what does that mean? I'm Neve Barker in the Mountain Kingdom of Bhutan. Join me later in the program. But first, staff at Google offices around the world staged walkouts this week. They're protesting the internet company's lenient treatment of executives accused of sexual misconduct. Rob Reynolds reports. In cities around the world, employees of Google walked off their jobs in protest over the company's policies and practices on workplace sexual misconduct. From its headquarters in Silicon Valley to New York, Washington and Boston, employees streamed out, denouncing a corporate culture they say tolerates harassment. Letting accused executives quietly walk away with buckets full of cash is standard and it really should not be. The employees were angered by a New York Times report that Andy Rubin, the creator of Google's Android mobile phone software, received a $90 million severance package in 2014, even after the company's own investigation found accusations of sexual harassment against him to be credible. Employees say sexism is rife at Google and allege executives act with impunity. Setting a high standard is really what I'd like to say. At Google's European headquarters in Dublin, employees showed solidarity with victims of harassment. Protests also took place at the company's offices in Singapore and in London. I'm walking up along with other colleagues in support of uh, anyone in any workplace who has been harassed and to ensure that perpetrators are not protected and not rewarded. Google CEO Sundar Pichai and co-founder Larry Page apologized to workers and promised changes in policy. Protesting employees are also demanding an end to mandatory arbitration clauses in their contracts, which prevent them from taking harassers to court. The Republic of Seychelles is pointing the way forward when it comes to environmental finance. This week, it launched the world's first blue bond. It's a way for the government to raise money to fund spending. The big difference is the cash will be used to protect the island nation from climate change and sustaining marine resources. The debt is backed by a guarantee from the World Bank. Now, how do you budget for Brexit when you don't even know what it'll look like? Well, the UK government did exactly that this week, and it means austerity for longer for most Britons. UK Chancellor Philip Hammond's spending plan was set out at a time when the EU and the UK can't reach an agreement on how to break up. Big spending decisions were deferred, meaning austerity is still in place. Public services, apart from health care, like schools and police, will remain starved of cash despite upgrades to growth forecasts. And there could be more pain in store. Crucially, in the event of a no-deal Brexit, public spending could be even lower. An emergency spring budget might be required. 
Mr Hammond's message was, unless Brexit goes smoothly, the prospect for further tax cuts and higher spending is not good. Hammond said if a deal is agreed, he could spend more money next year. Well, that would include the $15 billion set aside as a fiscal buffer. Meanwhile, the Bank of England has kept interest rates steady on Thursday. It also warned there is no guarantee it would cut interest rates to support growth and jobs under a disorderly Brexit. And all that uncertainty is having an impact. In contrast, business investment has been weaker than previously anticipated. The level of investment fell by more than 1% in the first half of this year and is now almost 15% lower than the MPC had projected just prior to the vote. As the Brexit deadline looms, UK companies are now understandably postponing investment until they have greater clarity over the UK's future trading relationship with the EU. Joining me now from London is James Knightley. James is the chief international economist at banking group ING. Good to have you with us. So where does the Bank of England decision leave the UK economy? Yes, I think, well, the problem is, of course, there's just so much uncertainty surrounding the UK right now. Not only is the, the Brexit worry there, but also geopolitically, uh, there's a lot going on, the global trade war as well. So the UK is looking very vulnerable. But at the same time, the Bank of England believes that there's very little spare capacity in the UK economy. Employment is at record levels. So that sort of backdrop makes it very tricky for the Bank of England to really guide us through this right now. And at the moment, they are suggesting they're going to wait and see and see what happens after Brexit, which hopefully will happen on March the 29th. Well, how appropriate can a UK budget be then at this point, given the lack of uh, clarity over Brexit over the Bank of England and its wait and see stance? That's true. Uh, the Bank of England and the, the Treasury are both telling us that there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and I would certainly uh, agree with that. But they're trying to provide a calming message to markets as we try and negotiate the final stages of the withdrawal agreements. And of course, both the Bank of England and, uh, and the UK Treasury, which issued the budget this week, have suggested that they could do more to support the UK economy if things don't go well. But likewise, if things turn out to be relatively smooth and we get a nice transition, the Bank of England also stands ready uh, to raise interest rates. So their flexibility is clearly being signalled by both the Treasury and also the Bank of England. But the Bank of England sent the signal that it can't say that it would be prepared to cut interest rates going forward. I mean, that message isn't entirely comforting going forward, is it? Well, I think, you know, he, he's got to try and, try and calm the situation and not sort of pre-commit to anything. Central bankers are a little bit nervous about pre-committing. We saw that in the referendum back in two years ago when the UK left. Uh, there was lots of words and, and comments made and people had to backtrack very quickly. Uh, but I think in terms of why he may not cut interest rates if we do get a hard Brexit or a disorderly Brexit, well, he, his point was that uh, it's a massive supply shock. If you've got the ports at gridlock and Britain can't import food, and by the way, we import 40% of all the food that we consume, that's going to be a huge issue. A 25 basis point interest rate cut is not going to alleviate any of those structural issues. Do we have any idea how much Brexit will cost after, I don't know, how long we've had this debate going on? Well, I mean, my simple response to that is if you look at what's happened this year, you've got a US economy that's growing at 3%. You've got a European economy, economy that's growing at 2%. Now, historically, I would suggest the UK should be somewhere between half and three quarters of the way between Europe and the US. So I would say the UK should be growing about, say, 25 to 2.8% in this global environment. This year, Britain is going to grow at just 1.3%. So therefore, I automatically just state that this year alone, because of just the uncertainty, uh, that has cost Britain's growth Britain about one and a half percentage points of GDP growth. Now, if we get to a hard Brexit story, uh, all bets are off. Uh, the structural problems about the ports, uh, about the financial services, about all the industries that UK is related to within Europe, that's just so confusing and so uncertain. We just do not know what is going to happen. So you would imagine uh, a, a quite a steep recession would be likely in that terrible uh, hard Brexit scenario. All right, so we don't know what will happen. We don't know exactly how much it'll cost. Do we know who's going to end up paying for it, though, James? 
Well, <laughs> I would imagine it's going to be the British citizens. Uh, we're already seeing that uh, through the effects of Brexit so far. The big uh, impact economically has, of course, been the collapse of the pound in the wake of that referendum outcome. That has pushed up imported prices into the UK. So consumer price inflation has risen quite rapidly. Our wages haven't compensated us for those cost increases. So there's been a big squeeze on household spending power. And if we do get into a situation where this environment is, is, is pretty, pretty dangerous, um, supply chains uh, are going to be, could be, could be destroyed, basically. If you see the gridlock at the ports coming through, these just-in-time production methodology that, of course, we all are uh, involved in these days, it simply wouldn't work. So you would imagine there'll be job losses as well. So it's going to be the households that will bear the, bear the brunt of it, and the government would have to try and step in and provide some sort of stimulus uh, to try and offset the pain. Is a compromise coming together over the Irish border, or is that wishful uh, thinking, if not reporting? I, I think it's... it's probably coming together. Um, it's, we, we hear so much back and forth in terms of the news flow. Uh, but I would suggest that uh, the EU is offering up concessions. Their main concession has been basically we extend the transitional period so nothing changes uh, for even longer. And the problem is time. We've got to get this done by March the 29th. Now, Britain has made concessions. Britain has backed down a lot. Remember, we, didn't say, we said that we weren't going to pay a penny. Uh, we've now offered 39 billion euros as a divorce payment. We weren't going to go for a transitional period. We were just going to do a short implementation phase. Well, now we're doing a full transitional period. We've basically been backing down quite a lot in terms of the UK. And I think that sort of pressure is going to build again. And uh, therefore, concessions will be made. But it's not going to come this week or next week. It's going to have to be much closer to the deadline for when Brexit really happens. James Knightley, it's been good talking to you. And finally, Bhutan is the only country in the world to measure the success of the nation not by economic growth, but by gross national happiness. Neve Barker reports from the Kingdom of Bhutan. Come on. It's a daunting climb to one of the holiest sites in Bhutan. Tiger's Nest Monastery seems to defy gravity. Every Bhutanese is expected to complete the pilgrimage to ensure peace and happiness. When it became a democracy in 2008, Bhutan put happiness at the center of all political policy, inspiring the UN to pass a resolution urging other nations to follow Bhutan's example. But how do you measure it? For many Bhutanese, happiness is more intuitive than it is quantifiable, but ever since it became part of state policy, it's been described roughly as good governance, the balance between nature and economic growth, but also between pleasure and work. In the capital, Timpu, is the world's only secretariat of happiness and a chief official who takes his job very seriously. The GNH index is found based on the nine domains and uh, close to 33 indicators, things like health, education, living standard, environment, good governance. Uh, one is psychological well-being. The other one is community vitality, time use and cultural diversity. This is one way people find happiness in Bhutan through traditional pursuits such as the national sport, archery. But the nation's happiness policy sometimes misses the mark. Youth unemployment is soaring. 24-year-old Namge Tenzin is restless for new opportunities, but he can't find suitable work. There's a major problem in Bhutan right now, uh, as the unemployment, because most of the youngsters, like after their like complete like completion of graduation, they couldn't find a good job. Neighboring India has been generous with financial support, but some think it's time to welcome Chinese investment too. Bhutan has no diplomatic links with its northern neighbor. But balancing ties between fierce regional rivals will be a challenge. It's a risky path. The happiness of the nation could depend upon it. For me, happiness is just uh, like a, just what I need is a peace and uh, like a good leadership in our country. For me, happiness actually means spending quality times with friends and families and uh, visiting beautiful places and taking pictures. 
So there may not be a magical, mystical, or even spiritual formula when it comes to finding happiness, but by simply turning its pursuit into policy, Bhutan has done what no other country has. And that's our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan. From the whole team, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.